Hello, Marcus. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. So what's up? I understand you have a question for me. <laughs> yes, and uh, you started the recording before I even tell you what the question is. So. Yeah. Yes, I I didn't want to have any time to premeditate <laughs> what my response might be. Yeah, I know you. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, so I'm thinking now how to formulate it. But let me start like that. Well, uh, I think since we met and I started to get and understand the phenomenological modality and philosophy. And establish the kind of a presence in me and then in this session with, with a client, with someone else. Uh, there are some things changing. And one of them is how I do the first session. Mm -hmm. So in the university, at the university, we learn like how to do the first interview, how to do the assessment, psychological assessment, the general assessment, and how to for formulate the case and how to plan a treatment based on the case formulation, whether it's, or the case conceptualization, whatever you call it. Uh, and then you actually start to think about doing the therapy. So it's like first doing an assessment, an interview, and then doing it. But uh, what is changing now in uh, my style of doing the work is that I, I realized I'm asking question, questions less and less, especially in the beginning than what I would do before. Uh, I learned that a lot of those questions might not, might not ever be relevant to the work that I'm actually doing. And I became more and more interested in meeting the person where they are. So in whatever circumstances they are meeting me in, they are contacting me. Initially, uh, I would just try to resonate and connect. And then maybe a little bit facilitate how they were speaking about their problem or where they are. But questions come less and less. So what I want to ask you is, uh, to give me an understanding of what does it mean to you to do the initial contact or the initial assessment or whatever you call it, or the, yeah, in transactional analysis, we call it contracting in the beginning, which is one of the most important uh, aspects of the work so that we are on the same purpose on the same minds about the work so yeah that's it well I think the beauty is I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> okay. I, knew what I, if I knew what I was doing I'd be self-conscious and I would be 
setting frames that were of my making. So I don't know what I'm doing. I, I think what I can address is how I'm being <clears throat> and how I'm setting a tone for truly meeting with the client and being open and being relaxed and being sensitized to how I'm responding to this client. I am relaxing into something new. Um, I'm helping to set a tone where the client just feels that they are participating with me in the unfolding of our time together. So that kind of genuine, innocently not knowing what to do sets a tone for kind of both of us being with the question, how shall we be together? How shall we meet in a way that's, I don't know, there's a kind of cleanness to it that sets a tone for kind of transparency for both of us so that we're not presenting, either of us presenting ourselves or presenting what's the presenting problem. You know, the client isn't presenting their problems and I'm not presenting my solutions. And yeah. hmm. there's, a, there's a, a, a sweet tone of openness, exploring, um, what in expressive arts is called the arrival of the third. Hmm. And I depend on that. I depend, then we both enter the third. And sometimes the arts are a good way. So I might start right at the beginning with some kind of art making as a way to to uh, decenter from the problem and just meet and you know who they are in a place that's deeper than their presenting issues and uh, just find a way to engage because I'm so resource oriented. And my first question really, not always, but basically my, my an essential question is, what are the resources that you have to respond to whatever difficulties you're, you're in right now? So this sort of resource oriented mindset when we meet, they can sort of set the tone that uh, like my basic resource that I'm working with is sort of this heart that's that has big ears. And I said, so what are your resources? And maybe they have sensitive hands that can explore uh, and refine their clarity. So something that starts out as, as abstract, as there's something about, I sense their hands, how they're moving their hands, they're creating clarity with their hands. And so it might give me an idea, let's do some movement as a way to begin our time together, to open up the time. You know, So there's a kind of, a, really, how I'm being with them and a kind of inviting them into a, a playful innocence that that has depth and intimacy and kindness and intelligence and lots of space for you know innocently exploring well you know wonder what our meeting can produce yeah. mm -hmm. I guess I'm getting some ideas of your thinking and the way the way of your being. But yeah. Hmm. So I'm curious about how this lack of frame in the beginning. Uh, is going to 
become something and lead to something that's not yours and not of your clients, but belonging to both and like a co-creation of minds. Yeah. yeah, I mean, setting a frame is really an external phenomenon. So phenomenologically, mm -hmm. if I want to establish resonance, I'm working from the inside out. And in that, yeah. in that, in that growing sense of connection, <clears throat> it can be called crystallization. So that of another facet, sensing another facet, and another facet, and another facet. So it isn't a this kind of a frame. It's more like, oh, from from the from my core or to their core, the sense of, oh, that's another facet. Yeah, I've got a little dinging phone here. If I can. Uh, yeah, yeah so sort of co-creating both my own crystallization of how I'm holding the client in my awareness and their crystallization of how they're sort of tracking any movement that's happening within them in response to the meeting. And then there's the 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 combined crystallization which I'm calling the third. So the it's it's not that there isn't a frame. It's like there's a visceral sense of creating the frame from the inside out in those three distinct, potentially distinct ways within, for each of us and between us. Kind of, so, mm -hmm. kind of listening and paying attention to this growing. Uh, met this metaphor of the, of the crystal, you know, which is a living thing. It's a living yeah. thing. I'm not applying a concept. The frame that I'm applying isn't a concept. I have certain theories about organic, moment-specific, person-specific, situation-specific framing that is more organic and sort of this image of crystallization and another, getting a sense of how many facets there are to each of us and separately and to the possibility of what we can do together. And that's quite visceral. It isn't uh, just a, a cerebral a following of instructions of how to set a safe frame, but to if I, if I like where I'm coming from and I trust where I'm coming from, there's something very organic that can happen in my making sense of who is this person and how can I be with them? And so I'm bringing sort of the quality of the artist to the therapeutic process. So that's what makes expressive art therapy what it is. The process itself uh, is a creative process. And in, in, you know, in my book, Expressive Arts, Education and Therapy, I look at something called uh, creative process based research. So you you're in this creative process and you see if you can describe it, which is like what we're doing now. So it becomes research on describing this very arts based phenomenological way of um, working. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, very visceral, very inside out. Mm. And uh, now I'm realizing what come what comes to my, my mind as something that worries me with doing this work is you know we classically learned that for clients that are that are more anxious or so to say, more traumatized, the more structured the framework is, and the more um, clear the framework is for them in the beginning, the safer they will feel. And so we do 
for instance, psychoeducation. We teach them about what psychotherapy is and what, what we are doing and how many sessions and what, what the time is. And then, so we actually prepare them with, with safety in the beginning. Uh, but in, in, this, in this way that we are now both uh, exploring, <laughs> It's a, another quality of this work. It's, it's a little bit, not a little bit, it's so different, <laughs> I would say. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't know your ideas on this. Yeah. Person specific, situation specific work with some people. Is it, you might want to work with more structure and set up frame and say, okay, we're going to work 10 sessions. This is what you can expect. With mm -hmm. someone else, saying that might make them feel really bad. Like, how do you know it's 10 sessions and how do you know that that's the way it's going to work. You don't know me. <clears throat> Other people will say, oh, that feels sounds so good. It's clear. I haven't had clarity in so long. I haven't had clear structure in so long. So um, to not get into the, the any kind of thinking that says this way is better or that way is, is better. And there's a wide range of, of how to work in in um, in the psychotherapeutic realm, <clears throat> and I think it's good to have a a large play range for how to be with our clients. And uh, I would say that <clears throat> sometimes I am. Making it a point to <clears throat> assure the client that uh, I have no idea where we're going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that we just need to relax and explore and they feel good. Like, oh, good. Other clients I might, might be more structured. because their nervous systems are compromised for whatever reason mm. and to to give them information about what's going to happen i sense is helpful for their nervous system yeah like okay be good <clears throat> but in all of that it isn't about what should i do the doing is a result of how I'm being with them. That's the common in the range of clients. How yeah. shall I be with them? And well, with this person, I will be more spell things out and more deliberate. And with this client, I'll be more open and playful. How to be with them. And then the doing follows. Yeah. Yeah. And my experience, that's something you don't know even in the beginning, the being, I mean. Sometimes you get uh, feedbacks like you're being um, too structured or you're being uh, so playful with this. I need, I need you to be like this. I need you to be like that. And... So you, you change. I mean, in the relationship, you change. You don't know it in the beginning. How you, how you want to be. Well, I, I try not to let too much time pass before I check in with the client. And uh, yeah, I'm not supposed to be a great magician that knows exactly what I'm doing. The trust isn't what I'm doing. The trust isn't how I'm being. And... 
I try to make educated guesses on how to go forward. <clears throat> and I, I call it checking out my imagining. I might say, I'm imagining that doing some movement work right now might be a bit much since we've just met. Is that true? Or I'm imagining that we've talked enough and, and you're ready to do a little painting now. Or, you know, it's okay. It's if you're imagining how to go forward with the client, which is what we are doing. Or it's the right use of imagination, imagining what would be supportive, what would be helpful, imagining I think mm -hmm. it might be helpful to just sit quietly for a minute. And I would say I'm just I'm thinking we might just sit quietly for a minute. How's that? You know, check out my imagining. Be transparent. Talk my process. You know, I'm not supposed to be a wizard. I'm supposed yeah. to be another human being who has some skill in navigating difficulty. That's all. Nothing to present, right? Some people want your philosophy presented or your basic theory, mm. what the sessions might look like. I can present the philosophy theory and way of working, but not myself. I show myself, I show me while I'm presenting work. It's different. So there's a kind of a tenderness that doesn't have to be vulnerability that's too much, like the just right tenderness with a client that's a kind of vulnerability that you start to feel at home in, you know, you, you're not the big know-it-all and, you know, the one who's going to make all the difference. Uh, yes. This work is relational and our relationship with them is important, but it is secondary to them having a relationship with their own wisdom and for them to see that I have enough access to my own wisdom to navigate our time together with this just right um, interplay of wanting to come from a place that I've experienced as wise, making wise choices, not too much, too little, and kind of modeling or being in a way that they resonate with how to be thoughtful, reflective, and something like being in relationship with their own source of wisdom. So I don't want this idea of relational importance to be misunderstood. No matter how important, and it is important, to have a good relationship with a client, my first concern is their relationship between however they're identifying and the source of their clarity, to have a good relationship. Sometimes I talk about a good relationship between their inner dancer and their inner choreographer. Mm -hmm. The inner choreographer says, it's time for you to be center stage, and they run off the stage. That's the relationship that I want to work with, you know, find an image or a metaphor for that relationship within within them that can use some attention. And then my relationship with them is to support and grow that, that healthy relationship within them. Mm -hmm. 
He might be the farmer in the garden, you know, and to listen to what they're saying and, and find the just right way to, to engage with them sometimes on that metaphoric level. That's where the expressive arts comes in, working with metaphor to say, you know, is it that your dancer and choreographer need to have a better relationship? And then I'd say, no, it's kind of like my chef in my stomach. And I say, I have no idea what I just said, but that's what came to be, that the one who does all the cooking needs to talk to the one who has to do all the digesting, you know. <laughs> and so, but it might take them months and months to open that up. So what does that mean? You know? So they might have a moment of, of insight, but what we've discovered over the years in psychotherapy is that an insight doesn't necessarily change anything. It's just the beginning of what to explore, explore that insight through that metaphor until something very embodied starts to happen so that they can then you know, embody that insight. Because if, if you don't embody the insight, which is a shift, it's not going to show up in your everyday life. You have an interesting insight within the frame of the therapeutic session, that's not our work. Our work isn't to have an interesting session. Our work is to increase the chances that their everyday lives are affected by whatever opens up in the session, whatever insights. Mm -hmm. so I, I might ask them, so last time we we had this image of uh, you and the chef on the tummy, you know. How, and you notice anything this week that 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 was affected by that insight? So there's a kind of a person-specific process. Yes, trust the process, but it's very person-specific, and you know, very organic within the frame of experience. Yeah. It has to be very organic. You know, I, don't, I don't have an agenda that where I can I know I can get this accomplished in 10 sessions. Yeah. No. And that, I way, that's makes sense. that way of working isn't wrong or bad. Do you have 10 sessions and you need to get this done? It's one way to work. Expressive arts is not alternative. It's a complementary way of working. It's another way of working for those who thrive in, in that kind of organic way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you don't know even what, what you expect in the beginning or what's going to unfold. No, only how it's going to unfold. Mm. Kindly and intelligently. Let us kindly and intelligently navigate our time together. And often the result is creativity. I'm not wanting to be creative and I'm certainly not wanting to be helpful because they'll they'll feel that that I need to be helpful, and that's stressful. Just shh, let's explore what presents itself and how to respond to that kindly and intelligently. How can we be with what's moving within you and between us? Let's kindly and intelligently navigate our time together. And so being a good clinician is uh, is a delicate thing that requires all of us, <clears throat> not, not just the ability to um, make good logical choices for the unfolding of the healing process, but for us also to be surprised by what we say or do or what occurs in the session. Like, oh, that was a nice surprise. Yeah, I'm always surprised by the metaphors that come to my mind during the session. I've never thought about them before, or images that come to my mind. Yeah, we need that. We need to be skilled and inspired. Otherwise, we're not very good therapists. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
so the metaphor is a moment of inspiration that are balanced with all of the skill building, the years of skill building, both, both hopefully alive and well in any session, the ability to access your skills and see something new. Oh, that's cool. I didn't see that before. Oh, I've never worked that way before. That's great. Really need I really believe in becoming highly skilled, really good um, at navigating difficulty, but also to be in a kind of childlike openness to, again, like it, well, like you just said, like a metaphor might come that really opens up a whole other area of exploration, a whole a new way of working. <clears throat> And sometimes I'll share what the metaphor is that I'm getting. But sometimes I just keep it for myself and want the client to have their metaphor for me. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Would, you, would you say a little bit more about not trying to be helpful? Is that... that would? Not just help me, but I think it would help a lot of people because it, in this job, in its sense, it's a helping profession. Uh, profession, and you get money to be helpful, and it's always this expectation to heal and to care and to do therapy. And you know, it, it kind of seems paradoxical, but. Yeah, if, I, if I'm helpful, that's not for me to say. That's what I kind of said, I was helpful. I'm just present and exploring the possibility that what we're doing in today will be useful tomorrow. So if the client says, wow, that felt really helpful to, to see that, I say, good, and... <laughs> or live your life mm -hmm. let's see if it's if it, if it's useful mm -hmm. uh, anyway. for me there's a big difference you know our conversation mm -hmm. you know, we're not wanting to say things that are helpful to you as a growing psychologist which I'm just wanting to sweetly innocently set a frame for something that actually might be useful <clears throat> so I'm not efforting. There's no efforting to, to want to be helpful, no wanting and needing to be helpful. Otherwise, for me, that's not sustainable. You know, I've been doing this a lot of years and it isn't sustainable for me to need or want to be helpful <clears throat> because then if I feel, oh, that wasn't helpful, you know, there's all this up and down. But it's just mm -hmm. it's very sweet, open, relaxed ways, just making educated guesses on what might be useful for this client. A kind of humility that feels natural to me to not assume anything, especially that something will be helpful. I don't know. It's, I don't know will be helpful it's it seemed like that was powerful but i don't know if it will have an impact on your everyday life which is what you're here for we'll see so there's this kind of beautiful open-hearted soft open heart sharp mind playful spirit that says let's see i had a teacher in way back in 1984 Donna Markover, and she said, it's the art of the possible. Don't be an optimist or a pessimist with your client. This is going to work. It's not going to work. She said, you know, it's possible that there will something remarkable will happen, and it's possible that something not remarkable. And nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see. It's the art of the possible when we're working. It's possible mm. that you will 
just awaken to so many areas and levels of you that your life will be just so filled with joy. And it's possible that the work we're doing won't make a difference and that your, your situation um, is just so profoundly difficult that it won't be affected very much by our time together. And okay, let's see, let's see, we'll do what we can. And that's relaxing. I remember I heard once you said that uh, I don't want to set myself up for failure, something like that, or to promise something that's not for sure. And so. I'll make up stories in my head about what's possible. Or, oh, yeah. or even in my heart. Oh, I hope, you know, just not make up stories. Yeah. All the energy of hoping and wishing and praying. It isn't wrong or bad. But what I ask, what's useful? And this phrase, it's possible that our meeting won't have much of an impact on my life. And it's possible that it will have a very profound impact and everything in between. So let's do some more. It's sobering and exciting. It's entering the unknown, entering the mystery together. Mm -hmm. Together, really together. And not I have some pseudo confidence that I can be helpful. That's a word mm -hmm. for me. Some people in some situations, it might be just the ticket. Just right. But it's just not the way I want. You said just a ticket. Yeah, that's an expression. Just the ticket, just the perfect thing. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's the right ticket to, to the entrance, the entrance ticket that'll take you right in. Yeah. Just yeah. the ticket. That's right. Yeah. I do think that making peace with our limitations is incredibly liberating. And you just do what you can. Yeah. Within us, and between us and around us. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the planet's in difficulty. I just do what I can with my own garbage. Hmm. So that's it. I guess I got my answers for today. <laughs> Maybe. Yes. Can you sum it up? Hmm. Yeah. Well, there is no recipe, I guess, to uh, to to sum up and say, okay, do this and do that and do. I guess the summary is just being open and relaxed, and see what comes up. And hold it, of course, professionally, but what's more essential is the openness and the, the resonance. And, Ashkan, to kindly and intelligence, find a way to be with a client that says, I need a recipe. 
how to respond kindly and intelligently. And they say, oh, no, I don't do recipes, you know. Within us, we know that we that's not the way we work. What is that? My Zoom is set that when I do something like this, it does that. <laughs> and, and when I, and when I when I do this, it does that. Really? Is it a new? Is it a new thing? <laughs> Pretty new thing, you know. It'd be nice if in the in the therapy session that those things <laughs> I could see it coming out of your heart and see the room filling with the third with all of that magical. <laughs> I have a big shift. Yeah, that's what's good about working on Zoom. You can actually see the, the heart opening and the and the third arriving. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Um, for me to say, yeah, I, I don't I don't have recipes. And when the client says, I need a recipe, to kindly and intelligently say, okay, here are some basic ingredients you're going to need. You're going to need playfulness. You're going to need spontaneity. You're going to need trust. It's almost like giving the recipe in the best way I can. for what comes spontaneously to me. And creatively, of course. Yeah. A, a kind of a translating what comes spontaneously for you and the person may have a very different brain and doesn't compute that kind of, you know, they say, can you just kind of spell it out for me? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's also part of crystallization. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it facets, different facets of the creative process. So it's not like you're giving them really this kind of a list, mm -hmm. a recipe. It's sort of like, well, there's this facet of the process, which is relaxing. Mm -hmm. That's part of the recipe, to relax. And this facet, which is curiosity, open to something new. So to find a way to give them what they sense could be useful in playing with you because they have a different way. They really would like a little bit more structure. So I want to yeah. respect that and find a way to, um, to create structure that's compatible with my way of working and their way of being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a recipe, but if the client slowly wants to create a recipe for their peace of mind, say, okay, I realized I need this, 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 and this. And great, okay. They're creating clarity in their own yeah. way. Otherwise, I'm sort of teaching them how to be. And rather than just modeling, this is one way to be. And you tell me how to be with you. Too. You tell me and what would be useful for you. So it's this 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 interplay of our own way, which might be no recipe, engaging with their way, which might be wanting to be more organized on how to make progress. Yeah. And to yeah. Find the third. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's such a loving way to work, you know. So that neither way of having the structure of the spontaneity becomes uh the right way. Yeah. You know, kind of okay, let's let's just be together and and together co-create how we're gonna be together. Let's see how my love of no recipe is going to interact with your love of creating recipes. Let's see where we go. Yeah, so loving and respectful and kind of... And kind, and kind. Yes.
which you're quite capable of so kindly and intelligently you know, to keep going forward as a psychologist, creating clarity. sometimes looking for clarity. There are things on the outside of us that we read or conversation that's useful. But ultimately to be able to have that sense of what I was caught talking about, that wisdom within us, to be able to create clarity from our ability to make sense of what we know in our hearts is true. What, what we know in our hearts can make a difference. And to give it some thought. And create some clarity for ourselves. So that's sort of that, to do both. Create clarity within us and together create clarity. It's a, it's a lovely, lovely way to live, to enjoy both. Thank you. See you soon. See you. Right. End this recording. Ciao for now. Ciao.